Welcome to another EduMed video. And in this video in the series on COVID-19, we'll talk a little bit about tips and anecdotes to the ITU management of these patients, which is, which is a continuous area of learning and we're continuously changing what we're doing. So this is really just where we are at the moment. We'll talk a little bit about ventilation, fluid balance, renal support and antibiotics. As I said before, this is a new disease. What we're seeing here is just anecdotal evidence. It's not, um, it's experiential and it's not based on RCTs because we just don't have that data yet. We don't know what the right answer is. And what I'm presenting here is just what we're starting to do in the UK and based on some of the experience that our colleagues in Italy, China and Spain are starting to filter through to us. So take everything that I say with a pinch of salt Things may change as time goes on, but this is the, our understanding as best as we have it to this date. The first thing to say about COVID-19 is that it's just such a spectrum of disease. We have patients who are completely asymptomatic to those who just have a little bit of cold-like symptoms and then that's it, through to patients who deteriorate rapidly within a course of hours to ECMO. So really... It's difficult to give de definitive management strategies for this disease when it's such a heterogeneous disease in and of itself. There's been a really useful um, document that was produced by the, um, the UK Intensive Care Society and others. And this was published on the 4th of April 2020. So it's uh, at the time of this um, video, it was uh, just yesterday. And a lot of what I'll be presenting is based on this document, and I'll put a link in the description to exactly uh, where to get this and other information about COVID. However, I've also put in a few little bits that aren't in the document, but were included in the discussion that um, a lot of us intensivists had during this um, meeting and also outside of it. There seem to be two phases to um, the disease. There's an early stage and a late stage. Early, there seems to be more of a um, vascular involvement with a procoagulant um, state with microthrombi forming. The lung compliance during this stage seems to be quite good. Then, this was you termed the sort of L phenotype and if you want to get more information about that please go to my video on the L phenotype of COVID-19. What we're finding is that there's also patients who are presenting initially with this um, vascular problem in the pulmonary vasculature which then subsequently leads into a hyperinflammatory state where there's pulmonary infiltrates and a more ARDS-like picture and then later with fibrosis and with secondary complications of being on intensive care such as fungal and bacterial infections. In terms of the ventilation, I think it's really important to emphasize that lung protective ventilation should still be employed. That is to use the minimum fractional inspired oxygen concentration you can to reduce oxidative stress on the lungs and to try and reduce your uh, driving pressures to below 15 centimetres of water. And thinking about your peak pressures, trying to keep them below certainly 30 or even lower if you can manage it. Using techniques such as proning can help with reducing driving pressures and peak pressures. And they should be used judiciously, but they should... Um, in the correct patients, but certainly most of our patients should get a trial of proning at the very least, and you will see benefits within minutes if it's working. The PEEP that we're using for these patients were probably too high when we first started looking after these patients, and certainly a lower PEEP strategy seems to be helpful, especially in the early phases of the disease. Again, see my video on the L type, L phenotype of the disease to get a bit more information about this. But like I say, proning is your friend here. Prone them early. The L phenotype certainly seem to do better with proning, um, and I'd personally say irrespective of the pf ratio however much oxygen they're on 
if the if they're certainly using more than 40 to 50 percent prone them early see what happens and often what you can do is reduce the fractional inspired concentration of oxygen but also you might find that your driving pressures reduce quite significantly in order to make this efficient to training up proning teams is probably a good idea that th that way you're not taking away the intensivists from the management of the patient to have to prone these patients and by having highly trained proning teams you can also allow them to help with maintaining pressure areas and changing the positions of the head and the arms throughout the proning period the um, document that the uk uh, intensive care group at uh, published suggested to using a PF ratio of less than 16 as a trigger. Certainly I think that's worth having in mind but like I say proning early is not a bad thing and um, there is good evidence now that proning um, the benefits that you get can remain for up to four hours after you've turned the patient supine and even more so in patients with the H phenotype or in ARDS. So proning is great and it's probably got its effects will last even once you've turned the patient supine for a few hours. So it buys you time to do all your normal nursing care needs whilst the patient is supine before then putting them back into the proning position. So there's no super rush to getting them back to being prone. Pulmonary vasodilators are probably useful in this group of patients, especially the L phenotype where there seems to be a VQ mismatch. Um, nitric oxide was classically what was used in a lot of intensive cares, but anyone who's used a nitric oxide knows that it you develop a so-called tachyphylaxis. You become more and more resistant to it over time. And so um, some trusts do use nebulized or even IV prostacyclin, and it's worth using whatever your um, trust has. We don't have evidence, but it does seem to be helpful in the management of these patients. If we are using, um, if we do have patients with COVID, we do try to use wet circuits. And especially in those patients with the H phenotype, the thick consolidation secretions, using a wet circuit certainly helps with expectoration of those um, secretions. You do have to be careful, however, because lots of people are using these HME filters, these things that you can see here on their circuits. This filters out the viral particles however you have to be careful because they can flood with water especially in wet circuits and by doing so it can cause blockages of the filters by just making them sodden and so if you start to see your peak pressure starting to go up or your ventilatory volumes decreasing um, or the co2 in fact just starting to slowly rise do think about the um, filters having been blocked and change them you should review them every 12 hours and probably change them routinely, irrespective of how much flooding there is every 24 hours, just to be on the safe side. Um, you, and the document itself actually highlights a very good point, which is a lot of the nurses and doctors on the intensive cares at the moment are not ITU trained. And therefore, we have to err on the side of caution where they may, may not be able to pick up on the problems such as flooded HMEs as quickly as those who are used to working on an intensive care. A really important point that we're starting to see a lot of is extubation and the problems that we're coming into with extubation. The first thing is upper airway swelling. We're seeing quite a lot of patients with upper airway swelling. So when you're extubating these patients, you have to be careful. It's probably worth doing a leak test this is where you bring down the cuff and you hear leak of gas coming around the cuff. That indicates that there hasn't been swelling of the trachea in the upper airways. Thinking about using dexamethasone is useful and also having some nebulized adrenaline um, nearby if patients start to develop a stride or once the tube has been taken out. Some people are suggesting having teams that are trained in surgical airways being around either through a a trained um, anaesthetic group or ENT surgeons just in case you get into trouble with a swollen upper airway and you lose that upper airway. Real problem that we're seeing is the reintubation and 
it can be as high as 60% of the patients in the UK are getting re-intubated at 24 to 48 hours. And this really goes back to that idea of the biphasic um, clinical course. And if you don't know what that is, please go and see my videos on the H and the L phenotype of um, COVID-19. These patients seem to be getting better, getting better, and then suddenly deteriorate again. And so we have to be careful of that and we should probably delay extubation longer than what we would normally do for a typical ARDS patient with a bacterial pneumonia or say an influenza viral infection. And alongside that, if patients have high inflammatory markers, do not extubate them. We are seeing that maybe the inflammatory marks, the first sign that the patients are getting that biphasic reaction. And if they are, then you'll be reintubating these patients relatively quickly. And that's probably stepping the patients back a few days, if not longer. These patients should not be spontaneously breathing early on in their disease, and that's for a number of reasons. Firstly, you're going to have a lot of untrained intensive care nurses and doctors on the units. Managing a patient who is spontaneously breathing is slightly different to with uh, continuous mechanical ventilation. And these patients can start drawing in big uh, tidal volumes, increase their transpulmonary pressures, and therefore cause more damage to their lungs. So, keeping them with continuous mechanical ventilation, sedating them appropriately, even down to um, levels of RAS of minus three, minus four, is probably appropriate in the early phases of this disease. And if the patients are dysynchronous with the ventilator, thinking about paralysis is probably a good idea, especially for the safety of both the patient and the nursing staff and the doctors who are looking after the the patients who may not be that experienced in managing mechanically ventilated patients. The Italians have uh, certainly seen cases of early lung fibrosis. It's not clear what the cause of this is. It might be related to the underlying viral infection itself. However, we do have to think about oxygen toxicity and inflammation from giving high fractional inspired concentrations of oxygen or allowing p patients to breathe spontaneously for long periods of time having large transpulmonary pressures and therefore causing damage to the alveoli and then subsequently leading to inflammation and fibrosis. It's also important to note that um, in some London units there's been reports of patients having um, wedge infarcts and peas without evidence of DVT. Now obviously it's difficult in the intensive care patients because you don't necessarily get a deep vein thrombosis in legs but you can get it in the pelvic plexus for example which you can't easily image. However what is interesting is that Covid certainly seems to create a procoagulant state and so we are seeing these patients with blood clots and it does raise the question of whether we should be anticoagulating these patients preemptively and the honest answer is we just don't know yet. Lots of people have been talking about CPAP and certainly in Italy they've used a lot of CPAP to um, prevent intubation as a bridging um, for intubation especially when um, healthcare resources are so sparse especially ventilators. They've had good results in Italy and there's been descriptions of patients being proned whilst on CPAP and it does seem to work and anecdotally have seen a few cases now of patients who have auto-proned, i.e. they've turned themselves on their chest and their oxygen saturations have dramatically increased. There are problems at CPAP, there's a question of whether we're aerosolizing. Um, in Italy they use hoods um, with HME filters um, that's less of a readily available thing in other parts of the world. However, if you've got it, it might be useful. However, do be wary of um, aerosolizing this into the atmosphere and therefore exposing other people, including healthcare workers, to this. I would suggest if you're using non-invasive ventilation, full PPE should be worn, including an N95 or FFP3 mask. The other problem is, is that especially some of the older CPAP machines do use a lot of oxygen and in this day and age where we might be having significant demands on our oxygen um, reserves, be careful about using this. <laughs>
As a general approach, most people seem to agree that what we should do is try CPAP for a short period, but if for any reason you think that the patient isn't responding or their work of breathing is still high, intubate them early. Even though you can temporize patients on CPAP for long periods of time, the question is these patients might then go on to develop um, the biphasic response and then develop quite significant pulmonary infiltrates requiring intubation and ventilation. And doing that in a crash situation is usually a lot harder than doing it in a semi-elective situation because once they develop those pulmonary infiltrates, they de-recruit very quickly and it can become quite a difficult intubation just purely from the perspective of um, re-recruiting these patients. Fluid balance is something that we really do not know the answer to. What we do know is that we're not getting it right at the moment. A lot of the patients who are coming to the intensive care are coming after a few days of fever, hyperventilating and being dehydrated. And for all of those reasons, the patients may be negative um, a couple of litres of fluid in terms of the total body fluid. And we in the UK are seeing a lot of patients with AKI, more so than in other countries. And there's a question as to whether we're giving a bit too much freezamide on the wards or managing these patients in the early um, days on the intensive care. Because the old mantra of um, patients with severe respiratory failure was to dry out the lungs as much as possible. Well, if you watch my video on the L phenotype of COVID, you will know that actually the pathophysiology is completely different and that we might be significantly harming our patients by drying them out too much. By giving by making them hypovolemic, you can increase their dead space and reduce their pulmonary perfusion and also create a more hypercoagulable state. Similarly, we're probably using too high a peep to begin with, and again, go and watch my video on the L phenotype to know a little to learn a little bit more about this. Echoes are really important, and I'd suggest getting an echo as soon as possible. We are seeing a lot of RV dysfunction, but not raised pulmonary pressures. Maybe that's because we're running our patients too dry. But certainly, COVID does seem to have a proclivity to the heart, and there are patients developing a myocarditis that can be difficult to manage, and these patients can deteriorate to cardiac arrest quite quickly. In general, what we what people are suggesting is um for the L phenotype to keep the patients uvolemic that'll maximize pulmonary perfusion and it seems reassuring because lung leak doesn't seem to be a big issue in the L phenotype and that's probably because it's more a problem with the vasculature than with the endothelium or with um the inflammatory exudates and so we can probably be a little bit more liberal with our fluids in the early stages However, when you do get to the H phenotype, so the pulmonary infiltrates, the pulmonary edema, then keeping them on the slightly drier side is probably a better option to try and wean them off mechanical ventilation as soon as possible. Antibiotics are difficult. Generally, as with all of intensive care, only start antibiotics if there's a clear indication. And what's slightly worrying in the COVID case series, especially in Italy, is that they're seeing a lot of patients with Aspergillus and Candida infections. And we think that might partly be related to the fact that by giving them broad spectrum antibiotics early on, we're wiping out their intrinsic uh, flora and therefore reducing competition for things like um, Aspergillus and Candida to proliferate. Procalcitonin certainly does seem to be a useful adjunct and um, doing baseline procalcitonins and then repeated procalcitonins may be a useful, albeit expensive, way to monitor these patients. It does seem to be quite helpful that if it's low, it's a good indicator to stop antibiotics. And in COVID, what we're often seeing is patients with very high CRPs, but their procalcitonins low or normal. So if you do start to see a high procalcitonin, do think about starting antibiotics or looking for signs of infection. The slight proviso is there are false positives with a high procalcitonin, so it may not be as useful for starting antibiotics, but certainly for stopping them it is fantastic and something that a lot of units are starting to use routinely. Renal support 
in terms of filtration is an interesting one. In the UK, we're seeing between 20 and 35% of patients being put onto a filter. Now, this is slightly different to what we were seeing in both China and the early patients in Italy. Now, it might be, again, that we're pushing our patients too dry, using too high a PEEP for these patients, and therefore causing um, a reduction in a cardiac output and worsening of their cardiac acute kidney injury. Um, but also, I suspect there's probably an element of intrinsic renal failure. And just like we're seeing microvascular thrombi in the lungs, it's pot potentially possible that we're seeing the same in the kidneys as well. If, you, if people are starting renal replacement therapy, what people have found is that these filters seem to clot very quickly. And so a lot of units have actually moved towards giving systemic heparinization and anticoagulation to patients just to try and prevent um, clotting of the circuits. That's partly a practical thing because often there's lots of patients who need filtration. There aren't enough nurses who are able to manage filtration appropriately. And also we have a finite number of circuits. So if they keep clotting, we can run into problems. Um, but certainly it's worth thinking about using therapeutic anticoagulation. Some trusts have um, found that they're running out of pumps. And if that is the case, uh, there are a few units that are starting to use um, therapeutic low molecular weight heparin. The honest answer is we don't have any evidence for or against this, but this is anecdotally what some people are starting to do. And if they're running out of filters, some people have even started getting the renal teams involved and starting patients on um, peritoneal dialysis. Honestly, I don't have any experience in using peritoneal dialysis in acutely unwell patients on the intensive care, but if needs must, that might be a, a method and certainly something worth discussing with the local renal teams. As we get more and more patients with um, COVID-19 requiring respiratory and ventilatory support, oxygen rationing is going to become more and more important. High flow is not a large feature of management in the UK, and that is for a couple of reasons. Firstly, there's the worry about um, aerosolization of the um, of the virus. Now, Vapotherm, one of the f um, companies that create high flow units, have done some aerosolization studies where they've put patients on high flow and then put a surgical mask over them and shown that there isn't a great degree of aerosolization. But the honest truth is we still don't really know what the data is. And certainly if you're using high flow, I would advocate for all staff in the area to use FFP3 masks and to protect themselves appropriately, treating it as an aerosolizing procedure. The other problem with high flow is that it uses a lot of oxygen and we've got a finite amount of oxygen in the hospital. So it's worth avoiding high flow where you can um, for the oxygen rationing perspective and for the aerosolization perspective. If we're using anaesthetic machines, there is the utility of using a low flow anaesthetic machines and um, using very low flows of oxygen coming through. However, again, that has to be done in the context of safety. And there are certain things with low flow that you need to be wary of, such as suctioning patients. You can empty the bellows and therefore make ventilation less effective. Also, the CO2 canisters need to be changed more often, which can potentially lead to risk of aerosolization and um, contamination of the environment. For patients who are being transferred, it's really important to calculate the amount of oxygen that you need and take the appropriate amount of oxygen in cylinders. Certainly, some of these patients are requiring quite high flows of oxygen, and as such, looking at the oxygen consumption is important. So in summary, this is just some of the things that people have been picking up in the UK and were summarised in the documents. And in addition to that, some of the observations that we've made in various institutions in the UK. Overall, it seems like less PEEP is probably a better thing. CPAP may be a good utility and may help some patients and help stave off intubation or at least prolong the time for intubation.
Now, it's arguable whether that's a good or a bad thing. Proning is definitely helpful. And the big takeaway from this talk would be have a low threshold for proning patients, whether they're spontaneously ventilating awake on NIV or if they're on a ventilator. Nitric oxide or prostacycline as an inhaled vasodilator may be helpful, but beware of early extubation. These patients often deteriorate secondarily and they can have problems with extubation such as upper airway swelling. So bear that in mind when you're thinking about extubating these people. Have the appropriate people around if you get into trouble once you've extubated. In terms of the cardiovascular status, do think about RV dysfunction, make sure that patients are euvolemic and be aware that the patients are hypercoagulable. So certainly if they're on extracorporeal support, such as renal replacement therapy, then do think about systemic heparinization. Now, this is not by any means evidence-based, but certainly anecdotally, we found a lot of filters clotting when patients have not been systemically anticoagulated. In terms of antibiotics, try and avoid them where possible, as with all ITU patients, but certainly in these patients, they do seem to be getting um, fungal infections later on. And um, if you can stop antibiotics, it's a good thing. In terms of how to stop antibiotics, procalcitonin may be a useful um, guide, and serial procalcitonins may be useful if they're available in your unit. I hope this is useful. Obviously, we'll update this with newer videos as more information comes out. But this is certainly some of the early experience we're having in the UK and informed in part by some of the experiences in both Italy and Spain and China.